Hello, and welcome to the CCF Online channel. We are excited for you to be part of another worship experience. We pray that what you learn here today will deepen your relationship with Jesus. Enjoy the message. Good afternoon, everybody. I, um, this is the uh, last opportunity I have to share here um, in uh, the Philippines before I head home uh, tonight via Hong Kong. And I should, um, I'll be home early tomorrow morning. And I have a couple of days uh, just at home and then speaking in a few cities in the UK. And I'm going to be missing the sunshine here in the Philippines. I'm going to be missing your beautiful smiles. I'm going to be missing your food. I will be honest, I won't be missing the traffic. Um, but it is uh, a delight and a joy to be here and also to be with a, in a setting where people are serious and intentional about trying to think things through with God and understand what it actually means to live well in this world and to live well with Him. And actually, this question of living well and what does it mean to truly live has become one which has received a lot of academic attention in the last 20 to 30 years. If you're familiar with uh, thinking about both government policy and even NGO charitable activity on a global platform, you may be familiar with a term called social well-being, SWB. And all kinds of different measures have been invented by the United Nations, the World Health Organization, different schools of thought and different Ivy League schools around the world to try to answer one simple question. How do we truly measure what it means to be happy, fulfilled, satisfied in this world? And why is it that as we see wealth going up in a nation, happiness, reported levels of happiness seem to go down. Why is it that once we've reached a point where we have enough food and enough water, that we keep adding in more and more in terms of our economic success, and yet inside we can feel poorer at times? How is that possible? And this question has been around indeed for a long time which is why so often we fill our life with distractions to distract ourselves from the problem of our own emptiness. And so we're looking to be entertained through television, through radio, through drinking, partying, whatever it may be, anything that can distract us or momentarily hold our attention because there's something within us that seems to be missing. Way back in 1971, the, Det the Detroit Free Press in North America decided to conduct an experiment. And this newspaper group rang up families and said, we will give you 500 US dollars if you will stop watching television for one month. Okay, so for one month, they were offered 500 US dollars. No TV. Do you know they had to ring 200 families before they found five to agree? Now, I think 500 US dollars is a lot of money today, but in 1971, which is decades ago, $500 was a lot of money. So eventually they found five. The five families were then monitored. What happened to them? Drinking, smoking, and the use of painkillers went up dramatically. At the end of the month, one of the women who was interviewed said, it was terrible. My husband and I talked. <laughs> when the distractions are taken away, all of a sudden, things are revealed and we're, we're wrestling with what it truly means to be full. Now, of course, one basic thinking, one basic idea that almost all of us share is if only I had enough, if only I had all the things which I don't have now, then this problem would go away. And what I would like to share with you this afternoon is actually how Jesus Christ himself directly addressed this issue, because he actually spoke to this issue directly. And so we're going to have a little read of what he said. It's very well known. And then we're going to take some time to ask us, ask ourselves, what is actually going on here? Because with Jesus Christ, you find 
that when he speaks, it speaks at multiple levels. There's an immediate simplicity to it that everybody can lay hold of. And there's also a depth to it, which means the more you think about it, the more profound it becomes. So I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter 12, verse 13, where it says, someone in the crowd said to him, that's to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out and be on your guard against all kinds of covetousness or greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Now this story is fascinating. Someone comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want you to tell my brother, the implication is younger brother, my older brother, sorry, to divide the inheritance with me. Now, what is this? Well, in the time of Jesus Christ, if you were an older brother, you inherited the bulk of the estate. When your parents died, you inherited most of it. In some cases, all of it. And your younger brothers got nothing. Now, I would like to say, as an older brother, I think this is a very good idea, and it should be followed even to this day. So, this is the younger brother, and he's coming to Jesus, and he's saying, look, please, you tell my brother. Divide the estate. Now, the question is, why does he want the estate divided? And the answer to that question is the same answer to the question, why do any of us want money? And the answer is, we don't want money for the sake of just having money. We want money for the things it will buy, for the things it will bring into our life, for all the satisfaction, the joy, the fun. That's why we want it. There's no point having it and doing nothing with it. We want it so that we can use it. So the chain of thought in the younger guy's mind is, look, I don't have this, and it hasn't happened, and I actually feel it isn't really very fair. So if you, Jesus, tell him to do this, and he does it, I will get what I want, and then I will be happy, I will be fulfilled. And so the chain of reasoning is a very common one. And Jesus starts off by doing something fascinating in this story. His first response is to say, who has given me authority to answer this question? The first thing Jesus Christ does is ask this guy and drives him back to a point of authority. And he's saying to him, okay, you want me to answer this question for you. Who has appointed me the judge in this issue? Now, it doesn't matter how the guy answers. If the guy says, well, I'm appointing you, then Jesus has authority. The next question is, will you listen to what I have to say? If the guy says, well, you have authority from God, Jesus will say, well, will you listen what I have to say? It doesn't matter how he answers that question. The question he's saying is, do you really want me to tell you? Are you actually listening? Who is giving me this authority? And it doesn't matter how he answers it. You know that sometimes there are questions which we ask, and we often sometimes hope that somebody won't answer it unless they give us the answer we want. So frequently, we're worried about what it could mean to come to know Christ. Sometimes it is very, very difficult. We want other people to be like Christ. We don't want to be like it. If he tells us what he wants us to do, we better behave that way. Do you know the story of the two boys who are arguing in the kitchen and they're fighting? There's one cookie left. 
There's only one biscuit left, a cookie. Do you use, you use the American word cookie here? You need to learn the English word biscuit. Anyway, there's only one, and there are two of them, and they're fighting, and they're arguing about who had the most and who that one belongs to. The mother comes into the room, and she's got a headache, she's tired, and she says, I can't believe it. You shouldn't be fighting like this. If Jesus were here, Jesus would say, let my brother have it. So the older brother turned to the younger brother and said, okay, you be Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes we're asking a question. Sometimes we're asking real questions. But we have to stop and say, wait a minute. Who has authority in my life to answer this question? Will I actually listen to what you have to say? So Jesus, first of all, takes him back to a point of authority. Then he actually drives him now back to an even deeper point. And he says to him, be on your guard against all types of greed. Now, the word translated greed there is a compound word as it's given to us in the Bible. It literally means to have a desire that cannot be satisfied. So when Jesus says in verse 15, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, old-fashioned translations translate it covetousness. It means to have an unsatiable desire. A desire, it doesn't matter how much you feed it, how much you give it, it's going to come back. And Jesus says you need to be careful of those kinds of desires. Desires which can never properly be satisfied. And now he's actually making the guy stop and think. Now notice something. Jesus is not saying it is wrong to look for satisfaction or to want it. As a matter of fact, the Bible never questions the legitimacy of our desire for true happiness and fulfillment. It doesn't. There's a very famous passage in Isaiah chapter 55. Some of you may be familiar with it. It sometimes gets read at Christmas time in some churches. And Jesus, uh, sorry, and the Lord speaks these words. He says, come all of you who are thirsty, come to the water. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and your soul will delight. You will delight in the richest affair. Now, did you hear that? God is saying, he is not, and he, as he speaks, he is not questioning our desire for fulfillment. He's not questioning our desire to be satisfied. He's saying, you are spending your gold, your money on things that do not fill you. You are spending your labor, your time on things that leave you empty. But come to me. Come to me and drink, God is saying. Your soul will delight in the richest affair. You will be full. You will be satisfied. So do you see what God is saying here in Isaiah 55? He's not questioning the desire for fulfillment and satisfaction. He's questioning where you can find it. And there's a big difference between the two. He's saying, look, the desire you have is right, but the means by which you're trying to satisfy it are wrong. This inner desire you have for fulfillment, for satisfaction, cannot be satisfied by external means. It doesn't matter how much labor, how much time you pour into it. It doesn't matter how much gold, how much money you spend trying to achieve it. You will not find it there. But if you come to me, if you drink from the water I give, God says, you will be full and you will be satisfied. God is not questioning our desire for satisfaction. He is ultimately questioning where is it found. And so we now see this here in Luke 12, where Jesus says, be careful of greed, unsatiable desire. And now he's going to develop that. He then goes on to then say to the guy, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. In other words, even if you have more than enough, your wealth will not give you life. Even if you have more than you ever dreamed of, that wealth cannot give you life. And then he tells this story. The story is well known. Most of you have probably here heard it before. You've probably heard it many times. 
Jesus says, look, there was a man and he owned land. And the land produced a big crop, okay, a large harvest. Now, there's a little play of language here in the Greek and of the Gospel of Luke as it's written. The word to bring forth um, is um, uh, freto. Um, it means to produce. Now, in Greek, if you take the letters E-U and you put it in front of a word, it expands it, it makes it bigger. So the guy says, to, as it's written in, in, in the Gospel of Luke, it says, Euphrato, from the Euphros, from the abundance of things. So Jesus is saying, look, what happened here is very unusual. We're not talking about a usual harvest. We're not talking about so much acreage producing so much grain or so much fruit. What we had here was an overabundance, an oversupply. Okay, everything produced way more than he could have hoped for, way more than you might expect. This is a bumper crop. It is huge. And thankfully, it's not in a perishable state. This is actually grain he's producing, so it can be stored. Now, the trouble with perishable stuff, as you know, in this part of the world, is it has to be eaten. It's hard to keep it. Okay, one of the, my favorite foods to eat in this country are mangoes. The mangoes which grow in the Philippines are incredible. When I lived in Saudi Arabia, we were all craving mangoes from this part of the world. Uh, I remember having mangoes in one part of the Philippines. It tasted like the mango had been made out of cream. It was wonderful. I also discovered what happens if you eat 10 mangoes in one day. It's not pretty. But, so we're not talking about a, a product here that perishes. He produces grain. And grain can be stored for many years. So the guy is now thinking, I've made it. Life is okay. The only problem I have, he now says, is what do I do with the wealth? So he looks at his barns and he thinks, well, those are no good. So he tears them down. He says, build big ones. I need huge barns. And they build these huge barns. And he stores all of this grain, all of this wealth in the barn. And he's thinking to himself, you know what? I can take a holiday, and not just for a week or a month. I can take a holiday now for years. I don't need to sow next year. I don't need to harvest next year. I don't need anything next year. I don't need anything the year after that or the year after that. I've got so much stuff I'm made for life. And so now having come into more than he could have possibly have imagined, more wealth than he ever could have possibly dreamed of, he tears down his barns and he builds big ones. And he says to himself, You have plenty of grain for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now, let me ask you a question. We're in church. So I'm going to ask you a theological question. Are you, if you are a Christian, allowed to be merry? Now, it's interesting. There are some here who've had enough theological education to say yes. You ask many people around this world in the church, are you allowed to be merry as a Christian? And they'll pause and they'll think, hmm, I'm not sure. I once remember speaking in a seminary where they were training vicars and priests. There were 110 of them. They'd had three or four years of theological education. I asked them, does God want you to be merry? There was silence. One person said, no. So then I said, are you telling me God wants you to be unmerry, unhappy? And he went, well, that doesn't sound right. Now, this word, which is translated merry here, it can have, be positive or negative. It's the context which allows you to tell whether it's good or bad. It is the same word here, we translate merry, that in Luke chapter 15, when Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons, and the one, younger one asked for his inheritance, sold it, and went away. And he lost everything. And when he was starving, he came back. And then the older brother comes and complains. Do you remember this story? The prodigal son, what are you doing? The father said, we had to celebrate. Now the word translated there, celebrate, is the same word. To be merry, we had to be happy. What is the appropriate response if something is lost and found? It's the same word. It's the context which allows us to tell whether it's positive or negative. So the question here is, is it positive or negative? 
So it's a very powerful image. When it's used in Luke 15 about the lost son, a child that was lost and you found them, how would you feel if you got them back? I have three children. My eldest is called Lucy. My middle son is called James. My youngest is called Amelia. This year, they will be 18. I have an 18th birthday party, a 16th birthday party, and my youngest becomes a teenager. So this is a year of many celebrations and probably many gifts, and therefore also much expenditure, but that's a whole other problem. Let's supposing, in order to celebrate, I arrange to go out on a big picnic. We go into the middle of the forest, I've got all kinds of special food, we've got blankets and rugs and cushions and all this wonderful time and we play family games and you know, afterwards we've eaten so much and we've had so many mangoes, we're sitting there going, oh, like this. What, what, what's that food I had that you fed me? Hello, hello. Okay, so you have that much sugar, you know you have the coma that comes afterwards, about half an hour later, right? And the children go off and they're running around the forest. And then it comes to the end of the day, it's getting dark, we're packing up. So I start calling for my children, Lucy, James, Amelia, come. And Lucy, she's so responsible, she's the first one to there, she's always there, right at the beginning. And then it's like, James, James, James comes. Now my youngest daughter, Amelia, she is more independently minded. When we were visiting, Beijing together, and she was two and a half years old, I have a video of her when we were visiting um, the Forbidden City, and she told us to go one way and us to go the other way. We thought she'll get scared. We walked all the way over to the other side of this giant square, and I have a video where I zoomed in on her, and she's walking by herself, and I zoom out, and she's just completely on her own. And she's not worried or scared about anything. And when we start walking towards her, she starts walking away. So I'm like, Amelia, Amelia, where are you? We can't find her. So what do I do? It's dark. It's now starting to rain. So what do I think to myself? Oh, well, you win some, you lose some. <laughs> Two out of three isn't bad. Let's go home. I'm going to stay until I find her dead or alive, because she is my daughter. And I'm gonna find her and I wanna bring her back. And God comes after all of us who are lost. We are his children and he wants us back. So when the father said we had to celebrate, we had to be merry, do you understand the intensity of the word? The word actually translated merry is the Greek word euphron. Now the frown is the diaphragm. Okay? To you from, to put the Greek word E-U in front of the diaphragm means to make it big. So how do you make the diaphragm big? There must be singers in the audience. How do you expand your diaphragm? And the answer is go, okay, well done. You breathe in. And as you breathe in, the diaphragm is pushed down and now it's expanded. So when it says, be merry, it's saying literally, I'm going to be big diaphragmed. It's saying I'm going to go, <sighs> that's the word. So you see how the guy's thinking. From the euphros, from the abundance of things, comes the euphron, this deep inner satisfaction, that deep sigh where you can go, <sighs> everything is great. It's the same word the father son says about his lost child. We had to celebrate, we had to euphron, we had to. <sighs> from the abundance of things, from the euphros, the euphrato, comes this abundance in life, the euphron. Now interestingly, as Jesus tells the story, as soon as the guy says this, Jesus looks at him Oh, sorry, God looks at him and says, you fool. Now, the word fool here is also very carefully chosen. The normal Greek word for fool, when you're reading the Greek New Testament, when you're reading the Bible in the language it was written in, the word for fool is the Greek word moron. Do you, have, do you use that word over here, moron? 
The Greek word moron translates into the English word moron. It means to be a moron. It means to be really stupid, foolish, an idiot. I'm sure none of us use that word. We're all kind people in the room. But actually, that's not the Greek word used here. The word, when it says you fool, it's not, it's not the word you're expecting. The word actually is aphron, which is a more unusual word, but it still means to be a fool. But it has a different mental picture. The throne is the diaphragm. The, let, the, the Greek letter A, the Greek letter alpha, normally operates as a negative. It negates what comes after it. It means to be diaphragmless. Jesus is saying, you who think that from the euphros, the abundance of things, comes the euphron, the abundance of life, you will end up aphron. You won't have a diaphragm at all. And now the mental picture is not of someone breathing deep going, oh, everything's fine. The mental picture is now the opposite. It's of someone who is completely empty inside. In other words, this is going to deliver into your life the exact opposite of what you hoped it would. It's a very strong picture. Imagine how disappointing it is to climb all the way up to the top of the ladder of life only to realize the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. Well, that's what Christ is saying here. It is possible to set yourself on a course believing it will bring one thing, but when you actually get it, you're going to end up somewhere else. This story, once you get it into your head, you can't get it out. Jesus says, this is what it's like. You know, there are so many things that we bring into our lives. The reason we bring them in is we think they're going to make us happy. All of us do that. All of us are leading lives which we think will make us happy. We're all consuming things, buying things, building things, taking things in, trying to satisfy some, satisfy some kind of inner desire. We all want to be fulfilled. And the good news, the incredible news in the Bible is God isn't challenging that. He's not saying if you want to become a Christian, if you want to truly worship me, that what you need to do is deny yourself everything and just simply look miserable and be miserable and the more miserable you are the more holy you are and the less happy you look you know the more the best the closer to God you are he's not saying that at all have you ever noticed that when we close our eyes and think of a really holy person a really someone who's really close to God when you close your eyes what do you imagine do you imagine a smiling person or someone who looks very serious have you ever noticed? When we think of holiness, we assume that means incredible seriousness. But actually what God is talking about here is an incredible joy. That's why if you're visiting here and you've got Christian friends and they always seem to be wanting to sing and dance and they seem to be so happy and even when everyone here was singing and dancing, you're looking around thinking, what's going on here? Why are they so happy? Is it some kind of drug? Do they put something in the water? What's going on? And the answer is, is that there is something that can satisfy us, but it's just not coming from where we think it should come. I was speaking in Hong Kong uh, last year, and there was a lady, a very senior business executive from one of the largest uh, North American companies, Dow Jones uh, listed companies there is. And she was on the front row. And all the time, she kept looking over her shoulder, looking around all the time. Every 20 seconds, she would, she would look over her shoulder. When everyone was worshiping, she was looking over her shoulder. When the message was being preached, she was looking over her shoulder. It was actually a friend of mine who was speaking. And afterwards, she went up to this woman. They got talking. She said, do you mind if I ask you a question? She said, all the time when everyone was singing, you kept looking around. She said, all the time during the message, you kept looking around. Why were you doing that? And the woman said, should I lead a very large business and I know what fake happiness looks like and I know what it's, what it's like 
to pretend to be happy in front of reporters, you're bored, other people. He says, and what I don't understand is I'm looking around at everyone's face and I'm not seeing fake happiness. I'm seeing something real and I can't understand it. How is it possible for so many people to be rejoicing all at the same time? There is something that Christ is able to bring into our life that fulfills us. He is not challenging your desire to be fulfilled. What he is challenging is where that fulfillment ultimately comes from. And he's saying, well, you need to be rich before God. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me just bounce back into Isaiah 55 because we started reading that passage about God saying, come, come to me and your soul will delight in the richest affair. And the answer is actually found in the following verses. Now, I'm gonna skip over a little bit, but God basically says, I'm gonna make a covenant with you. But in verse six of Isaiah 55, God picks up the narrative again. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him when he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, the unrighteous their thoughts, let them turn to the Lord, he will have mercy on them, and to our God, he will freely pardon. So you see what it's saying? It's saying when God is close to you, turn to him. When God is near, accept him. Turn away from the wicked things you're doing and the empty things you're doing and turn to God, and God will have mercy. God will pardon and forgive you, All right? So you, you see it, when God is near, turn to him, he will forgive you, he will satisfy you. So the question is, when is God near, All right? If God is near, you turn to him, this will happen. So the question is, when are you near? Well, verse eight, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now let's stop for a minute. There was some good news in the first part. When God is near, turn to him. He will forgive you and satisfy you. Next question, God, when are you near? Well, as the heavens are as high above the earth, that's how high I am from you. So what is the space between heaven and earth? Look, I'm telling you, that's a big gap. So the answer is, he's not near. He's a long way away. His thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. His ways are much better than our ways. God is, is a long way away. Now this isn't good news. Does that make sense? If it's true that when God is near, we can turn to him, he'll forgive us, he'll pardon us, we can be fulfilled. And then we say, how near are you? And he goes, well that's easy. You see, you see how far the heaven is from the earth? You know, there was a story, two, you know, um, American students sitting on a beach. It's dark, they can see the stars, the moon, and one of them turns to the other and says, what do you think is further away from here, the Philippines or the moon? And the other student says, are you stupid? Can you see the Philippines from here? Some of you understood that. He's a long way away. Well, that's a bit depressing. All that promised delivery, no hope of realizing it. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 10, God says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is the word that goes from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and you will be led forth in peace. Now, do you see what God then says? My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. As the heaven is as high above the earth so are my thoughts and ways above yours. But 
just as the rain comes down from heaven and the snow to earth, my word can come down from heaven to the earth and water it and make it flourish. And it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Well, what's the purpose he sent it? Well, we're told the purpose was he wants to forgive us and pardon us. So when this word of God comes from heaven to earth, it achieves the purpose for which he sent it. We are forgiven. He can forgive us. And what is the result? You'll be sent forth in joy. You'll be rejoicing. You will suddenly know this true you thrown in life, this deep satisfaction, because he has come to you. So this passage in Isaiah is actually Christmas. This is about Christmas. This is a Christmas sermon. I know it's January, okay? But go back five weeks, Christmas time. This is about God coming from heaven to earth. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He came from heaven to earth. The purpose for which He came was to forgive and freely pardon. This Word achieves the purpose for which it was sent from heaven to earth. So now, how near is God now? And the answer is, well, when the rain hits the ground, how close is the rain to the ground? And the answer is, well, they're touching. When the snow comes down from heaven to earth, how close is the snow to the earth? And the answer is, well, it's on it. They're touching. And when the Word of God, Jesus Christ, comes into this world, He comes down and He is now in contact. He is touching us. And if you drink from that water, you will never go thirsty. He can fulfill you. Jesus Christ said, come to me and drink. On the day of the Feast of Tabernacles, in John 7, we read that Jesus said, come to me and drink. He met a woman who said, sir, give me some water. And Jesus spoke to her. And he says, if you drink from this well, you will never be thirsty again. And he's talking about himself. Where does your satisfaction come from? Where is true joy found? And the answer is only in Jesus Christ. But notice the means by which he achieves it. First of all, God comes from heaven to us. That Jesus is not talking about. God is not talking about us trying to find God. There isn't a path from earth to heaven, but there is a path from heaven to earth. God makes it. He comes down to us, and then He offers to freely pardon us. Now, why is this so important? The answer is, it's because we've all done things which are wrong. In the pursuit of pleasure, we have done things which have hurt us, which have harmed us, which have broken us. We have done things which have damaged us. Let me see if I have this here. Okay, let's put the AV team to use. Is that where you are in front of me? Can you see this? Can you put that on the screen? Am I holding it in the right kind of location? Can any of you see? Okay, there it is. Look. Now then, you have any idea what you're looking at? Okay, this is Hebrew. Now, let me explain it. And this is only one of the ways we damage us. In the book of Corinthians, it, there's a section, the second section, it talks about sex. It talks about what we do with our bodies. And it says, you know what? It's actually reported that the same man and his son, they share the same woman. And he says, and that profanes God's holy name. And then he says, in doing this, you're hurting yourselves. Now, interestingly, in the Old Testament, there's a parallel passage where one of the prophets says, a man and his son are sharing the same woman, and in doing so, they profane my holy name. But here's what's interesting. Do you see the difference between these two words? They look very identical to you. The one at the bottom here is Hebrew hal. You put you, yar at the end, you have the word hallelujah. Praise his name. 
This word here, hal, with a hard H, hallelujah, profane his name. The difference between a hallelujah before God, a praising of his holy name, and a hallelujah, a profaning of his name, happens by closing this little gap here. And it converts this from a soft H to a hard one. The distance between what it means to live a life that profanes God's name and pleases his name is covered by the distance between these two. When you close that gap, and the result is when you live that way, you end up hurting yourself. It literally damages our bodies. We're seeking pleasure. We're doing something which at the time often feels good and we desperately want it. But we're reaping the harvest in our own bodies and we live with the consequences of it and it's impossible to get rid of. There are other things which we do. Spending our money, our time on things that we think should satisfy us, should please us, should fulfill us, and they don't. So we do more of it and more and more. And every time you need to do something more extreme to get the same amount of pleasure. It's like being on a hamster wheel. The first time you take drugs, you only need a little bit to get high. The second time you do it, you need a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. You need to run faster and faster to get the same amount of pleasure. You're literally burning yourself out. The same with sex. Initially, it can, you know, it could be just looking. The next time, it has to be more, and then more, and then more, and then more, and then different varieties, and then older and younger and more violent. More and more extreme to get the same amount of pleasure. Or with our expenditure. First of all, it can be this kind of car. But then to get the same amount of pleasure for the next few purchases, it has to be that one, and then that one, and then that one. We need something bigger and bigger, more and more, just to give us the same amount so we end up going faster. They call it a hedonic treadmill from hedonism, trying to get pleasure. The hedonic treadmill, you have to run faster and faster just to maintain the same level of satisfaction in life. And in the pursuit of that, we do all kinds of things which are wrong. We compromise ourselves, we hurt ourselves, we live with the guilt or the pain or the fallout of it, and we wonder how on earth do we get past it? And the answer isn't to run faster. The answer is to stop and turn to God. And instead of drinking salt water of this, that, from this world, you drink the pure water that comes from Him. It doesn't matter how much salt water you drink, it will never satisfy your thirst. And actually, if you keep on drinking it, it will kill you. But if you turn to Him, He can forgive you. He can wipe the slate clean. Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth. He came into this world and he made himself one with us. That's what happens when you put your trust in Christ. You become one with him. And all the stuff that's flown into your body, all of the poison, all of the brokenness, all of the pain, it becomes his. He takes it on into himself. And when he goes to the cross, he pays the price for what we have done. By his stripes, we are healed. All of that pain, all of that hurt, all of that poison in life, all of the curse that flows from going against him and doing the wrong things, all of that becomes translated onto Jesus Christ. All of the sin we have done becomes his. That's why the Bible says when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he became sin for us. All of the curses in our life, all of the spiritual damage and hurt that is in our life gets onto him. That's why the Bible says he became a curse for us. This is very powerful language. It's saying everything which was in us is now put on in him. And he pays the price. He takes on the consequences for what we have done wrong. And he lays down his life. And he pays. And through his resurrection, he conquers over all of it. And he comes to us and says, Turn to me, drink from me. Your soul will delight in the richest affair. 
I don't know what it means to you to be a Christian or what you think it may mean to lead a holy life or to be made holy by God. He's not interested in emptying you. He's actually interested in filling you. He can feed you and water you with things that you cannot possibly imagine. Some of you have already heard parts of my testimony where I talked about the fact I didn't want to become a Christian because I thought I would become miserable. After I became a Christian, I couldn't hide the joy which I knew. It was impossible. Everybody thought I'd gone crazy. I can remember I'd go to church, I'd come back one Sunday lunch, I was having lunch with some friends, they looked at me, they said, what did you do this morning? I said, I went to church. They looked at me, they said, but you look so happy. You could see the logic. You've been to church, you should be feeling miserable. Why are you so happy? And the answer is, because I've been forgiven, because someone's changed my life because there's a fulfillment in my life I thought wasn't even possible. It doesn't matter how much money I spend, how much, how much time I put into it. And I put a lot of time into trying to make myself happy. When, when we moved out of the Middle East, we moved to a small country called Cyprus. And at that age in my life, I was just trying to do anything to make myself happy. Uh, I loved the movies. So I, I did what they did in the movies to make themselves happy. Okay, they seem to be happy, that's what I wanted, so I'll copy them. I had all kinds of heroes that I used to copy. One of my heroes was James Bond. James Bond had a silver cigarette case. I had a silver cigarette case. I used to smoke filterless cigarettes. I could flick them into my mouth, catch it in your mouth. Doesn't matter what end you catch, you can always light the other side of it. I used to smoke these huge cigars. One of my heroes was Arnold Schwarzenegger, an amazing actor. I can't believe he hasn't won an Oscar. I've seen all of his movies multiple times. One of his movies, he's walking around carrying a tree and smoking a cigar. I don't have the build to carry trees. I smoke cigars. <laughs> the person I loved the most was called Clint Eastwood. He was the coolest of everybody. I really wanted to be like him. I saw every Clint Eastwood movie that there is. I love the Westerns, Western movies. He was the coolest of all of them. There's... Um, when he was being interviewed once by, an inter by a reporter, the reporter said to him, Mr. Eastwood, why does everyone think you're so cool? He took a little cigar from his pocket, he put it on the edge of the table, and he flicked it so it started spinning in the air. While it was spinning in the air, he produced a match from his back pocket, he caught the cigar, struck the match under the table, lit it, inhaled, blew one big smoke ring, three little smoke rings through the big smoke ring, and said, I don't know. <laughs> I wanted to be like him. I used to take that little strip that you light a match with, I used to stick it to the bottom of my shoe. So having flicked the cigarette into my mouth, I could lean against a wall, take a match and shh, light it like I'd seen happen in the movies. Why was I doing all of that? Well, I was looking for happiness, for fulfillment. They seem to be happy, they have it together, I want to be like them. The very things I was doing was emptying me. What are the things that you're pursuing? Where is your energy going, your creativity, your money, your labor, your gold? Where is it going? Does it satisfy? Christ came into this world. He alone can meet the deepest desires of our heart. He alone can satisfy us. He's able to deal with all of the guilt, the pain, and the hurt in this world because He came from heaven to earth the living word. And at the cross, he crucified it there. And through his resurrection, he offers us a new life in him. And we can know that forgiveness. And we can know that joy. It will not return to me empty. It will accomplish what I desire. It will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And you will go out in joy. And you will be led forth in peace. I'm wondering as you sit here this morning, where you are with God. Is it possible you've come from the outside and for the first time you're listening to these words of Christ and you're thinking, actually, this is me. You're talking about me. And I need to know that peace. I need to know that joy. I need to know that forgiveness. And I need to say yes to Jesus Christ. Well, if that's you, I'd love to pray for you. But maybe it's also possible you're sitting here as a Christian and somehow you've got your focus shifted in the wrong place. 
You're looking for satisfaction, happiness, joy in the wrong places. You're looking for it in sex, or money, or drugs, or consumption, whatever it is. And it doesn't matter how much you get, it's simply not enough. And you need to come back to the author of life today and say, actually, I need this word that, comes from, that came from heaven to earth, and I need to turn to you again. Well, if that is you, I would love to pray for you and to pray with you. And I would invite you just to take a moment, just to bow your heads and close your eyes and ask yourself, Lord, as I sit before you, where am I in this? And if you know that you need to say yes to Him, you need to respond to Him, you need to turn to Him, I would just simply invite you, just raise your hands where you are as a sign before God to say, look, I want to receive this from you. I need it. Yes, I can see them going up. And I want to pray for you. God wants to freely pardon. It's why He came. It's the purpose for which Christ came. So, for all of you who are, who are before Him, with your hands as a sign to say, Lord, I need to receive this gift from you, just pray with me. Dear Lord, I thank you, you love me. Lord, I'm sorry. I've been working and looking for the right thing in the wrong place. Lord, I've been so desperate to know this you throne, but I've been messing around with all these other things, and Lord, it's wrong. And I've hurt myself. And Father, I want to pray that you, Lord, would forgive me. Lord, that I may know this pardon. Lord, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he is the word of God that came from heaven to earth. I thank you that you paid the price. I thank you that you made forgiveness possible. And I pray that the real fruitfulness that is promised in Isaiah and Jesus talks about would be true in my life. Lord, help me live a life that is rich towards you. And as a result, may I know the richness of your blessing in my life. And it's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. I, if you have prayed that for the first time, please talk with the person you came to or come down here and tell someone. There, is, there are welcome centers on two floors in this church where you can go. They will feed you a snack. I think there's coffee, there's tea, there's water. That's not the reason for going. That's important, but it won't ultimately satisfy. But they can tell you more about the one who can. So either come to the front and talk with someone or go to one of those centers and talk with someone if you responded for the first time. It's been a joy for me to be with you. I love you and I hope I can see you again sometime soon. Thank you for having me in your presence. Jumpstart your spiritual journey by joining an online or offline small group. Go to ccf.org.ph slash dgroup. Worship together with us via live stream here at 9 a.m., 12 noon, or 3 p.m. Philippine Standard Time. Join us at stream.ccf.org.ph. Want to find a CCF near you? Check us out at ccf.org.ph slash locations. We are so excited you were able to join us today. God bless and see you next time.